My out-of-studio partner on today's program is Greg Durrell. Greg, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Good to be with you. We are going through Paul's epistle to the Romans. And Greg, before we get into that, I don't know how, how we can communicate how important uh, the book of Romans is to, uh, to every believer. Uh, it's foundational. It's the most important doctrine related to being a Christian. Paul lays it out. What do you think, Greg? Well, I think you're right. I've said it over, and I'll continue to say, but but I would encourage every believer or every listener to go back and read the the first eight chapters of the book of Romans, because they're going to see very clearly that Paul goes out of his way to establish that there's none righteous. Everybody is lacking divine righteousness. In chapter 1, that's his point. That's the theme. We need divine righteousness. We don't need self-righteousness. So it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. So if people will just read the Word of God as Paul has laid it out for us, they'll come to an understanding that God loved us in spite of ourselves, gave himself for us, that we might be given his righteousness, and with that comes everlasting life. It's a simple, marvelous picture people need to embrace, whether they're Catholic, Baptist, Methodist. You know, there there are no religious denominations in heaven. They're only believers. And so we need people to come and realize that and see that. And if they would, I think their lives would be changed forever. Right. Now, we're in chapter 8 of Romans, and we're going to pick up with verse 28. And these verses, the next three verses in particular, some some weighty doctrine in them, but some ex- obviously excellent doctrine. All doctrine is simply what Christ teaches, and so it's all it's all wonderful. But just some, sometimes we don't have a uh, an understanding of it that we should a biblical understanding. So we're going to go over some of those things. Verse twenty eight, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, somebody would say, what are, you, what are you kidding? All things work together? You mean cancer and losing my keys and whatever it might be? Well, the answer to that is yes. What does this say? It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. In the verses preceding that, we talked about the Holy Spirit interceding for us. God, God loves us. In whatever situation, whatever circumstance that we might come into, whatever might be uh, causing us problems, whether it be health problems, financial problems, whatever, we're saying that you go through them, but you don't go through them alone. God is there. God will enable you. You're not going to lose the joy if you do this with God. You know, people just relate it to the analogy that the Lord uses all the time, and that's the analogy of a family. If you have a child, oftentimes you will put certain restrictions and things and and responsibilities on, on the child that the child may think at the time are very grievous and unfair. But but you're doing that for the betterment of that child. You're building character. You're building patience, etc. As Paul points out in Romans five, these, these things sort of work together. They're sort of a chain reaction, and one builds upon another. And so here he proclaims to us. Because of whose we are, and, and because of the indwelling Spirit of Christ within, that all things, whatever it may be, are going to work together for our betterment, not for our detriment, but it's going to be a blessing when we come through these things. Mm-hmm. And so it's a marvelous promise that every believer should make use of. And it says, to them who are called according to his purpose. In other words, the most important thing is not getting whatever problem you think is before you solve, okay? Okay. The most important thing is growing in your relationship with him, your relationship with our Lord. And in that, that development, that maturity, handling these problems, it's not that God won't intervene in a certain aspect of your life and, and, and heal you. God makes this available, as we said last week, in the, most, in the best way possible, and that is according to his will. There are some things that we think are right and that we think we need but we don't have the mind of Christ. We don't have the understanding that God has about it with regard to our maturing, our developing as Christians. The whole idea of the Christian life is to walk with him, to grow in our relationship with him, to understand him better. And all of these, Greg, as you said, all of these things that come along can do that for us 
if we understand what, what God is trying to do in our lives. And no question. And bear in mind, too, that the Lord, He calls everyone to Him. The Bible clearly tells us, uh, John tells us, Romans tells us, that this gospel, this gift, is open to all. Now, those that respond, obviously, are the called, those that believe. And he says, and called according to his purpose, or to the plan of God. What is the plan of God? That we serve him, that we're ambassadors for him. What is the will of God? John 6, that we believe on the Son. So this is not some deep, deep, intricate thing, nor is the, the next verse, verse 29, where he says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. While some tend to extract and mine some great theological rhetoric out of these passages, remember, Paul tells us that the Bible can be understood by a child that a child can understand it. The psalmist tells us that the entrance of the Word of God gives light, gives understanding unto the simple. And so when he begins to talk about those called according to his purpose, for those he did foreknow, talking about obviously God's foreknowledge. God doesn't operate in time like you and I. God is outside of time. He can look back at creation. He can look at eternity future. He can look down like he did with John on the Isle of Patmos and take him down to the tribulation period. He can look back in time. And so those he did foreknow, how did he foreknow? Because he's divine foreknowledge. He's infinite. And he also did predestinate. That word in Greek for predestinate there means to limit in advance. God in his foreknowledge set out a plan, and he set down a plan for each one of us. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. He has a plan for all the listeners, even those that are not in Christ yet. There's a plan for them. At some point, perhaps God knows when they'll come to him. And so this is not a complex thing here. It's a very, very encouraging passage, and it's simplistic in many ways. But it's when we try to make it something mystical that, that many people, I think, just, just miss the whole truth to be found here. Well, Greg, I think it's, in, in some cases, it, it's, it's a little worse than that. They, they come up with a, a concept or a doctrine that runs so contrary to not only what the Scriptures say very simply, but it lacks simple logic. For example, well, let me read verse 30, and then we'll go back over these two. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, simple words here. Foreknow, as you pointed out, is foreknowledge. God foreknows those who he also will predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Yet some teach, based on this scripture, 29 and 30, and some others that they would pick up, that God predestines some people to heaven and some people to hell, to the lake of fire. But that's not what it's saying here. It's saying, when it talks about being called, it's saying they've not been predestined to heaven or hell, but and, see, they're called according to his purpose. We read that in 28. So sure. there are those that God knows are going to respond to the gospel. And those who will respond, he's got something for them to do. So it's, it's to a blessing in, in most cases, but it's never to where they're going to spend their eternal destiny. Well, you know, we could say 29 and 30 really is the basis for the promise in verse 28. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, if we're called according to his purpose, then he must know what that is. And certainly God knows what his purpose for his creation is. And then if God knows that, and then he has foreknowledge, and then he's called, and he's predestined, and he's conformed. But note also it says he also justifies, and he also is the one who glorifies or conforms to the Son. So it's the Lord that does it all. And I, and I think that's what, what the, the point Paul really has been making since chapter 1. This whole thing is not about us, but it's about him. It's about his righteousness. It's about his plan. It's about his creation. It's about his fulfillment. As Paul points out in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 15, at some point down the line, God will be all in all. And I think we tend, a lot of times, people tend to take the focus off of Christ, denying him the preeminence, as if we have some special prominence. And man can get very easily uh, wrapped up in, in man worship. And you know, we find a lot of people worship at the feet of scholarship, and we need to just approach the Scripture, as you've pointed out so often, as a Berean, 
with no preconceived theological bents. Just approach the text, see what he's saying. Don't try to read something in it. Don't try to make it mystical, but just let it be real. See what it says, and, it, and we're going to find it's not that complex. Right. But once again, what we want to point out here is that, again, with regard to the issue, as, as some preach, that predestined, it would be a way of trying to underscore God's sovereignty, saying he predestines everything. Yet there has to be a willingness here. Those whom he foreknew, God foreknew that some would be willing. And sure. those who were willing, he gave them something to do. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Verse 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Greg, have you ever come upon a package so absolutely wonderful? I mean, I even hate to use the word package, but there it is. And in the verses that we've read, starting with 28, right through this one, he's freely given us these things. Well, you know, Tom, there's a marvelous, I guess, cross-reference we could say to that, uh, to this, and it's in Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places Mm -hmm. in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So it's a question, he chose us in Christ. So the issue is to get in Christ. How does one get in Christ? By faith. It, it's not a question, again, of some mystical thing or some hierarchical thing or some election thing. It's a question of faith alone in Christ alone. Then in Christ, these blessings come, these marvelous promises that we've been uh, talking about in Romans 8 become ours. They become real to us, and it should be a, a huge encouragement to all believers. Mm-hmm. You know, again, one of the things that concerns me about those who would say, well, there is those who God has elected. He has uh, chosen them according to his good pleasure. And on that basis, those he overlooked are predestined to hell for all eternity. And they're dead in their trespasses and sins. They, there's no way that they can uh, have eternal life because God overlooked them. You know, I think about Ezekiel thirty-three eleven. It says, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil way, for why will you die? God has no pleasure in that. And uh, for him to just not extend irresistible grace to some, because of as many right who believe this, that it's according to his pleasure. Well, Scripture says, no, it's not his pleasure that any should perish. That's right. Greg, again, verse 31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us. Wow. Think of any religion throughout the world. There is no God who sacrifices himself for his creation. Wow. Unbelievable. Amen. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to thebereancall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is thebereancall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24 7. Don't none go with me. I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back.